Okay, well let me say welcome to everyone while the last of you are getting seated. I'm Judith Roden, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and it's terrific to welcome you here. Um, and thanks for making time to be with us this evening. Uh, let me just say one word about the Rockefeller Foundation for those of you who aren't familiar with what we've been doing lately. Um, our vision is really to see a world in which more people can tap into the benefits of the 21st century opportunities afforded by technology, afforded by this global economy that despite some of its current stripes um, is uh, certainly opening opportunities for many countries and many people around the world, but at the same time strengthening resilience to the risks that globalization is also um, creating both for people and communities and countries, whether they're financial or environmental or social. Um, we call this smart globalization. We think it embodies the, the uh, necessary metaphor um, that really will advance thinking um, in the field of philanthropy. To us, it means connecting more people in more places with uh, innovations um, and the tools uh, that really will make globalization work for them. Uh, we're particularly excited about one such innovation, um, and that is the emerging field of impact investing um, that we're going to be talking about this evening. In part, our enthusiasm is grounded in the recognition that there simply are not sufficient philanthropic dollars, not sufficient government aid dollars or multilateral aid dollars um, to meet all of the world's great social challenges. And if there really is an opportunity to do well by doing good, to, to have a financial and a social bottom line, and really make impact, that would be truly transformational and extraordinary um, as the, the world's issues and world's problems seem to grow greater, not smaller. Um, to really understand this field, we supported the Monitor Group, and many of you have seen the Monitor uh, Institute report that was published last year. Um, their assessment uh, is that the impact investing industry could grow upwards of $500 billion annually, um, that maybe they were pre-recession dollars, um, but certainly um, it is a lot of money and a lot of resources that we are still talking about. Uh, since last fall, the Global Impact Investing Network, um, which is now spun off to be a separate NGO um, and is being uh, helped in its uh, launching by Rockefe Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and others, um, have really been pushing the frontier of impact investing. Many of you have worked with the GIN, that's the acronym, um, to help assure that private capital flows efficiently into businesses that can improve, improve people's lives and improve the environment um, and health and, and so many other areas. So far, uh, we think the GIN is really playing a seminal role in convenings, gatherings like this one, disseminating, disseminating reports, um, like the two excellent reports we'll be discussing tonight, um, one from Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and the other Parthenon Group and Bridge Ventures. Um, the first is, is really a veritable how-to monograph for those investors and those financial professionals who are committed to translating an impact investing strategy um, into action across their investment portfolio. And the second um, has and has compiled terrific real life examples of how impact investing deals made by a range of investors across asset classes are working. For example, 30,000 units of affordable housing here in New York City, 80% um, reduction of wasteful water usage in regions of Tanzania, and hundreds of millions of dollars in microfinance loans to rural economies. So uh, without further ado, um, and with the great pleasure of welcoming you and of taking some birthing pride um, in all of this, and thanks to Anthony Bud-Levine, our great leader um, at Rockefeller, who really is leading this work for us. Um, I am very pleased to introduce Amit Puri, the GIN Director of Strategy and Development. Um, he's going to guide this conversation um, and I hope that it is one more step in really building the kind of great momentum 
um, that this field deserves and the kind of reward that I think the ultimate group, uh, goal will produce, um, which is really improving people's lives um, while at the same time using the kinds of resources, the knowledge, the due diligence capacity um, of the financial sector uh, to help make smarter investment decisions, to help enable um, uh, businesses to grow more effectively, um, and to demonstrate uh, that it really is possible to have social and financial impact at the same time. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rudin. Um, and as Dr. Rudin mentioned, my name is Ahmed Ford. Um, I have the pleasure of being a director of the Global Impact Investing Network, along with Camilla Seth and Sarah Delton. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say some thank yous. I certainly want to thank the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Dr. Rudin, uh, the Impact Investing Team, Particularly, or in particular, uh, Antti Buglavini, uh, Andrea Porter, and Terrence Strong, who helped make this event happen. Um, and on our side, I would like to thank the, the GIN team, uh, particularly Melody Meyer uh, and Beth Barron, who uh, helped organize this event put it together. Now, as uh, Dr. Rudin mentioned, uh, this is very much an emerging industry, and the Global Impact Investing Network's role in that in, uh, emerging industry is to help uh, increase the scale and effectiveness of impact investing. Um, and impact investing, to be clear about what we're talking about, um, is the use of for-profit investment to achieve social and environmental impact. Um, and that is different from philanthropy, um, and it's also different from negative screening. And while all of those are important strategies for how people think about having an impact, what we're talking about is specifically the proactive use of investment uh, to target things like addressing um, access to financial services, uh, clean water, affordable housing, um, access to energy, and others. Now, one of the things um, that we focus on um, is really uh, comes across kind of three main elements. Um, we work with the leading impact investors uh, through impact, uh, their investors council uh, to help organize them and help them push the frontier for the impact investing industry. Uh, we also provide tools and resources to investors, uh, in particular our impact reporting and investment standards, or IRIS, uh, which is a standardized uh, framework for measuring social and environmental performance of investments. Uh, but what brings us here tonight um, is our focus on helping to elevate the profile of impact investing and helping to get the best practices in the hands of those people who are going to put it to use. Um, and we have the pleasure tonight of having four great panelists um, who are representing two reports. Uh, they represent a range of interests um, and perspectives. Uh, and so with uh, Ralph Morris, uh, we have uh, someone who's worked as an advisor for a long time in the space uh, who's now working as an asset manager with Google and Partners. Um, with Melissa Berman, um, and runs Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Uh, someone who's been advising philanthropists for a long time and has come to understand the interest uh, and demand for different ways of using investment capital. Uh, with Tracy Polanco, we have uh, of, uh, Arthur and Group. Uh, we have a, a management consultant um, who's had the opportunity to study this industry um, and produce a great report along with Bridges Community Ventures uh, that will help um, illuminate some of the, the opportunity that's here. Uh, and with Michelle Giddens of Bridges Community Ventures, uh, we have an investor. Um, they, they run several funds in the UK um, and have clearly been a pioneer of this industry. Uh, but before we get started, I turn over to the panelists. Just want to ask a couple of questions to the audience so we can all understand uh, who you are and how to best calibrate our remarks. Uh, the first question is, um, if you would just please raise your hand um, if, you've been, if, if you've ever been involved in making an impact investment. Um, and also, if you could raise your hand if you've been involved in making an impact investment at more than one asset class or more than one sector. Okay. Um, so we'll actually have, um, uh, we'll start off uh, with the RPA report and have Melissa Berman talk about, uh, from her perspective, uh, Melissa, if you could talk a little bit about, after you produced the first monograph on mission related investing, uh, what led you to develop this report and what was the demand you were seeing from your clients? Sure. This is what happens when you give um, somebody who's a liberal arts major a <laughs> full of electronics. <laughs>
Foundation um, for hosting us and putting this terrific room of people together, but also for uh, being among the organizations that help to support uh, the publication solution for impact investors. Um, in addition, we were uh, ben we benefited from the generous support of the Felisa Toss Foundation, uh, from Legacy Works, from the Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation, from the Flora Family Foundation, and from the Woodcock Foundation. So um, this um, entire publication has really been a terrific team effort. Let me say just briefly, um, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors is an independent nonprofit, and our mission is to help donors create thoughtful, effective philanthropy. Um, we are actually not a unit of the Rockefeller Foundation, although we are always happy to receive their email. Um, we got into this field uh, relatively early. Our first publication of audition investing was in 2008, and I believe we, we were uh, putting panel discussions together about it, it even in 2007, I've been coming for panel. And how did this happen? Um, this happened really because uh, donors came to us and said that they were interested in using um, the entire range of their resources, um, and they were often speaking about their personal resources and not just their philanthropic resources to drive their goals. And we would politely explain that, you know, as Ami has clearly also explained to us, you know, philanthropy is here, and investing is here, we're here, we're not there, and they would say, but there's nobody over there that we can talk to, so we're talking to you. And eventually they began to come into these discussions carrying a two by four, and, and so we began to pay attention. Um, and um, what we, I think what led us into it, even though we really are a nonprofit focused on philanthropy and the expertise of the folks in our organization is philanthropy in its traditional sense, is that we saw very serious barriers uh, between um, the programmatic folks and the investing folks, uh, sometimes between the legal folks and the um, people who were mission oriented. And we saw those uh, divisions whether we were talking about philanthropic resources, personal resources, or any other kind of financial resources. Um, and so um, we began to uh, put together what became our first um, publication on this, uh, which uh, was co-authored by Steve Odeke and Doug Power, both of whom are here. Um, and we began to put our toes in this water, um, uh, even though we were you know, clearly uh, a nonprofit concerned with philanthropy, with very, very strong support from our board of directors, in particular, Stuart Davidson and Reen van Kent from the Netherlands. Um, and then uh, 12,000 copies of our monograph were distributed, downloaded, mailed out, um, and uh, stolen from dentist offices across the country. <laughs> And, and so that was another indicator to us of serious levels of interest um, in this field. Um, we next began to get involved in as serving as the fiscal sponsor for many of the kinds of initiatives that were trying to connect uh, what looked like the two sides of a yawning debate on this issue. Um, we began with the Carbon Disclosure Project. We're also the fiscal sponsor for the Sustainable Endowment Institute. That cluster now includes Confluence Philanthropy uh, and the Global Impact Investing Network, or GIN. We are currently in search of uh, an initiative which will have an acronym of TIME. <laughs> um, and then we began to do work with some of the leading foundations uh, who are active in this field, either through our board connections or through actually advising them. That includes uh, the Kleisners, with whom we worked in partnership uh, with my fellow panel panelist Raul for many years. Uh, the Heron Foundation is uh, part of the board of RPA. We've also worked with Park Foundation Endowment for Health. Um, and that began to give us a sense of what the potential would be for this idea of this second monograph, The Solutions for Impact Investors, uh, which was co-authored by Steve Godeke and uh, Raul Pomares, um, and is the one that we're here to talk about tonight. Um, I think what's um, really important to us about this particular second one and, and what we think holds such great potential for the fields of philanthropy as well as the fields of, of uh, investing is that not only does this address the kind of demand that we've all been experiencing, 
but it really um, does a great deal to move forward the very important uh, debate about assessing impact. Um, and understanding and being able to put some um, milestones and quantifiable measures around social and environmental impact as well as financial performance is a critical issue for the field of philanthropy as a whole, whether you're talking about grants or whether you're talking about investments that have a philanthropic purpose. Uh, and so it's the marriage of those two things that we think of as um, particularly important um, for this publication and why we're particularly proud to be affiliated with, uh, with the event because that is a key part of what they're working on. Um, we're going to be continuing to, to be active in this field um, and, and continue to feel it's an appropriate way for us to um, make good on our mission of helping donors create thoughtful, effective philanthropy, not to turn the tables on the definitions here, but we would think of thoughtful, effective philanthropy as financial resources that are used for social change, uh, and we don't particularly care whether those financial resources are grants, loans, equity investments, um, or time. Um, we are um, going to be announcing tomorrow a strategic alliance between Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors and Go to Keep Consulting. Uh, our colleague Ray Richmond in our San Francisco office will be our practice leader, and my colleague Chris Page, who is here, is providing overall uh, strategic guidance as a member of the senior management team at, at Rockefeller Philanthropy. Um, and what we are going to be doing, we hope, in partnership with many of you in this room, is helping more and more organizations get from idea to action. We continue to see uh, barriers early on, really, in the strategic planning um, and goal definition process, uh, barriers in terms of overcoming unfamiliarity um, from moving from one field to another, barriers in terms of the different languages that are spoken by the different players in this sector. Um, and we hope to be helpful in playing that something of a translation role to help get people to this age where they would then turn and work with people who are investment consultants and advisors, um, as well as investment managers, like my friend Raul. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And Raul, um, as an investment advisor who's built a practice in this space, uh, we'd just love to hear uh, how an advisor should use this report and what led you um, as a practitioner um, to get involved in a project like this. Sure, great. Uh, thank you so much. As, as Anna pointed out, I, I, I'm coming from the other end of the spectrum uh, to what Melissa was talking about in terms of rather coming from philanthropy. I spent the last 17 years in the invest, uh, as an investment advisor uh, across uh, various uh, organizations and platforms. And uh, I first want to say that, you know, again, just to reiterate that uh, this, you know, this work could not have been, could not have been possible, and in particular my personal work in this space, without the support of Charlie and Lisa Clarkson, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, and uh, Kale Felicitas in terms of truly, you know, being willing to uh, allow me to, uh, in effect, uh, execute these strategies, and then their willingness to be so public about it. I think that has been one of the most important aspects of driving this industry. I also just want to reiterate my thanks and acknowledgement to Steve Gadecki, my the, the co-author uh, of this piece. He, uh, he and I uh, labored intensively to put together something that we really hoped would fundamentally address many of the barriers that um, Melissa referred to. And you know, one of the one, one of the first barriers that we identified uh, and felt that was important. We actually took the lessons. We we, we turned to lessons from traditional best business practices. And that was this notion that we took from, our, from Jim Collins, author of uh, Built to Last, and what, and what he described, what were the characteristics of the best in, uh, companies was those companies that embraced what he referred to as the genius of and, and avoided this tyranny of or. And what, one of the fundamental hurdles that we felt was many of the, do, many of the conversations uh, around this subject, as Melissa pointed out, between program staff and investment staff, uh, was always around this, that this was some kind of decision that it was, well, no, you had to make an investment or have impact, but you couldn't do both. And we think that that, first and foremost, is a tremendous fallacy and that clearly that no different than in best practices in business, best practices investment also recognize and understand that you can have, a, a, you, you can explore investment. Did I just lose this? Okay. Um, you, you can make investments and that, that meet a social environmental objective while adhering to strict, rigid investment policies and practices. You can assess and evaluate an investment for its investment merits and 
address and identify what its social and environmental aspects are. And so that, that's, that's one of the main pieces. And as, as part of that process, excuse me, the Cuban in me, I've got to stand up. I don't see what sitting down. Um, was to really create what is presented here as a, a, as a linear framework, but really this is a much, this is much more dynamic. We struggled with how to graphically represent this. But it, this idea that fundamentally this process, and to, to the honest question, you know, what, you know, what, how could other advisors and what we hope that this piece will empower other advisors with is the ability to recognize that it's fundamentally a process of first establishing and identifying your strategy. And again, it's about embracing the end. It's, it's about going through whatever existing process you may have as an advisor or the, as an asset owner to determine what the appropriate financial risk reward objective I'm seeking, but also understand you know, what, are, what is my mission, what are my values, what are the impact themes that I want to, uh, to achieve. And so again, establish a strategy. And from that strategy, come away with a cohesive impact investment policy that takes into consideration all of the financial objectives that you st that you stated, while simultaneously addressing your, objective, your <coughs> objectives. Once you have that policy in hand, then the work then it comes time to go ahead and implement that. And again, really, what that's about is generating the deal flow. And this is one of the things that's so, so important about the work that uh, that Pantheon uh, has also done to really emphasize the types of opportunities, the things that you should be looking at and analyzing those, and of course evaluate that impact. And again, although linear, clearly, you know. As we experienced, you know, we went through a process in the case of Chaos Plus Utahs where we, we defined objectives. For example, some of our earliest investments in microfinance, we made capital markets assumptions. You know, six, seven years ago, this wasn't an industry that we could point back to and had a track record. So we had to start with somewhere. And so from an investment perspective, I said, what is emerging market debt? Well, let's, let's put it in that bucket uh, of the portfolio. Clearly, as the results have shown, uh, we've now had to reassess and reevaluate it. And so this process is, is continuous. The last thing, Rather than um, given the time constraints that, that, I, that I want to talk about, you know, or one of the other big misconceptions, I mean, often we hear that well, the pro oh, well, you know, the, there's these additional costs. Impact, you know, impact investing costs costs more. Uh, one thing I will suggest, so I want to respond to that that point, and happy to address other questions later. Uh, and that's just this idea that you know, first and foremost, yes, impact investing requires a much more uh, re not much more requires a very immersive approach. You know, in, in terms of assessing, evaluating, you know, one as an investor, one needs to get in there and understand the DNA, understand the markets, understand the cultures uh, of where you're de where you're deploying capital. So, what, and this is where, regardless of whether you're, as I just recently was, you know, walking around a farm outside of Johannesburg and looking at opportunities there, or whether you're looking at these opportunities right here in some of the more economically disadvantaged communities of New York. You have to go. You, you have to go into these markets and understand what these opportunities. And someone said well, that makes it very expensive. Well, yes, but is it expensive because of the impact, or is it, is it expensive because it's good investment sense? And I think one of you know, we didn't touch on it yet, but one of the things that the impact investment industry, I believe, is positioned to take advantage of significantly is the, the significant economic crisis globe that we've globally just come through. When you when you when you look at not only some of the things that you know, most people touch about in terms of the results of uh, microfinance relative to uh, other asset classes and the performance of our friends at Generation and others who have proven that uh, taking this comprehensive approach can deliver uh, outsized risk adjusted rates of returns while satisfying this, this impact. In this day and, you know, this day and age, uh, you know, the impact investor has this opportunity to recognize this. You know, we all got very comfortable in the investment industry uh, being able to basically sit back and for many years we could just throw a dart and it was going up, <laughs> right? And those, those, those days are long since over. Uh, and the, oppor the, the, the opportunities and the abilities that I just described that are inherent to a good impact investing, I believe are just good investment sense, you know, transparency, you know, I mean, how many people fought, just followed blindly and went into investments that ultimately turned, turned into fraud? Well, had they done their due diligence as they, as they should, irrespective of impact, just done the work and done the work well, they could have avoided much of that. So uh, again, I think it's very important, and again, that's why I applaud the efforts of, of all, many of those here in this room to really get the word out about what these opportunities are so that we can next overcome this hurdle, which is, well, this is great, but there aren't opportunities. The answer is there are. Thank you, Raul. And well, the RPA monograph really focuses on um, how you can translate from a strategy to an uh, implementation and traces the experience through a number of investors that they profile. Uh, the, the Bridges Parkrun report looks at 
um, how you can deploy investment in process and process uh, both leading with the financial motivation as well as the impact motivation. And so I'll uh, turn to Tracy and just ask you from your perspective, um, in the, the scope of the evolution of this industry, um, what led you to focus on this report and identify specific and highlighting these opportunities in this way? Thanks, Ahmed. Um, before I answer the question of um, how we see the industry evolving and how the industry has evolved, um, I have to iterate my thanks to you. Know, we, we gotta do the niceties. Um, so thank you to the Rockefeller and the Jim for hosting. And in particular, when Michelle and I think about, to borrow Dr. Roden's uh, remarks, birthing of this project, we have to thank you, Anthony. Anthony has been a legitimate co-birther in this uh, wonderful process. So he edited laboriously. He was just a wonderful partner. Um, we are just so excited about this uh, report um, and in answering Ahmed's question about how the industry we see it going forward, uh, I think it's useful to think about how, how it has evolved. And I like to think about it from the perspective of the investor, the buy side, as well as the perspective of the investment fund, which is the supply of investment funds. Um, from the perspective of the buy side, if you will, um, the way we built this report around is based on the monograph taxonomy, which is the two types of investors. One, uh, which we call financial first investors. These are investors that have a fiduciary duty to deliver risk adjusted market rates of return. And they can't just kind of, you know, go off and, and do things because uh, the impact uh, in, in, on society, on the environment call them to do. And these are typically investors um, who are pension uh, uh, funds, who are other institutional assets uh, bound by those return requirements. The other kind of investor that we are going to overlay these investments uh, with the lens with is what we call impact first investors. And these impact first investors are investors whose primary goal is to seek social and environmental returns while achieving some financial good at the same time. And it's important to say that uh, these two are bound by, um, for the impact first investor and the financial first uh, investor, um, return of capital as the floor for, for the financial piece. So from the grant maker's perspective, the negative 100% grant making model is not part of impact investment. So no matter what, you're gonna get a return of capital um, and uh, some in the case of impa uh, impact uh, financial first investments, market rates of return. Um, so what we've see, what we're seeing over here is the blue. I think the Chinese and me should stand up too to follow the Cuban. Um, what we see in the blue are the financial first investors, and what we see in the yellow are the impact first investors. And impact first investors are the types of investors that Melissa pointed out foundations, high net worth in, uh, individuals who have more of a, a latitude in the investment mandate to pursue things that are um, not necessarily receiving market rates of return. And the powerful framework that we're showing here uh, is that we were able to map all these different investments in a traditional <coughs> asset allocation spectrum that are very familiar with traditional investors and map each of these types of investments and investors along this whole chain. <coughs> Um, a quick note is that this work was done last year, so before Peter Knight raises his hand and says, Generation is no longer three and a half billion, um, it's because we did the work last year, for example, Generation is now at six billion, and a lot of these funds, including Bridges, uh, have also grown in, in assets, which is a wonderful thing for the industry. Um, what we've seen is that there's been a proliferation of different asset classes over time. Uh, what the industry started off in its roots, which is social responsible investing in, in, in the 80s and the 90s, um, you know, initially in, in the public equity sector because of those roots, and then in the cash sector because of the, all the community deposit programs, what we've seen over time is a proliferation of different asset classes to go into alternatives. We have private equity and, and venture capital to even hedge funds uh, to, to quasi equity and uh, other debt instruments. We've also seen a lot of uh, not only the breadth of the asset class, but also breadth in the geographies that these funds touch. Um, they go from developing world to developed world. We have root capital who are providing kind of what they call the, the missing middle banking for uh, farmers who are too large to access microfinance funds, but too small to get bank funds. 
Uh, so they go in there and, and provide financing to the missing middle and also provide them with um, uh, uh, international value chain contracts. You know, they'll secure the, the farmers with Starbucks coffee contracts and shea butter contracts with the body shop, et cetera, so that that um, capital is much more secure and the business model is much more secure. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, in other parts of the world, ambulance uh, companies in India, uh, India is doing uh, uh, homes in, in Mexico. So geographically, uh, this is also getting a lot of diversity. In terms of scale, um, we have big funds out there, uh, microfinance funds, you know, the one that we're profiling in Blue Orchard Fund is $2 billion, but we know that's a lot more capital being put to work in microfinance generations all the way upwards at six. Uh, and then we have much smaller funds who, who are actually going into local communities all around the world, which are in the five, 10, 50 million dollar range. So um, the diversity is just really exciting. And um, if you think about how the industry has evolved um, over time, uh, also in terms of uh, sector focus, so if I'm a foundation and I care about um, health, um, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you can't really find an instrument that addresses healthcare because the roots of this industry has been in microfinance and clean tech. Now, um, it's not shown in this chart, but in another chart in this book, through these uh, new layered structure or yin yang deals, you can buy an immunization bond. Um, you can get into a sustainable forestry. So different um, individuals, different organizations with different missions can go into this um, field of impact investment and get a financial return and also fulfill your mission. Um, in terms of thinking about how the industry has evolved from the investor point of view, it's actually interesting to note that it was really the philanthropists and the impact first investors that really got the industry going because you needed these people to take the risk to incubate innovation, uh, take microfinance in the 60s, and you know, not really the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, it's really the philanthropic base that got the industry going. And once uh, track records are demonstrated and we've proven that this thing works and provides market rates of return, then you have the commercial capital pouring in and now the whole field is burgeoning. So it's exciting to know that you know while you need uh, both the orange and the blue investors to really play uh, to get the field going, you need the impact first investors to incubate and to prove the concept and then you need the commercial capital to scale up. Um, in terms of um, other kinds of investors, we touched upon foundations, high net worth, institutional money. It's also really exciting that retail investors are beginning to play in, in, in this uh, world. Um, I mentioned the immunization bonds, the Gabby bonds. Um, that particular one pulls the capital of different types of investors. And in, in the report, we call them layered structures because you're pulling together capitals with different return requirements, different motivations, and you bring them together and everyone achieves their objective. And in the case of the ITHM bonds, um, it's actually being offered in the UK as a retail product. And uh, hopefully that movement is gonna um, gain traction over time. So um, I'll uh, give it to Michelle, but. The rest of the report basically takes each of these investments and profile them in detail, not only at the fund level, but from, we also interviewed limited partners, and we actually talked to the investors. Um, so you get it from the limited partner perspective, the general partner perspective, and also we profile one underlying deal for these investments, as well as highlighting the financial performance of the fund and the social uh, impact on the community. Thank you, Teresa. And before we turn it over to Michelle, I just want to let all of you know that we'll be opening up to questions from the audience. And so please start thinking about what you'd like to ask this panel. Uh, so Michelle, from your perspective as a pioneering investment company that um, started some of the early funds in this space and then broadened your mandate uh, to include uh, different strategies, can you tell us a little bit about how you view um, this report and the opportunity that it outlines? Great, thank you. I have to stand up too. It's nice to be able to see everybody. It's great to have everybody here. A uh, couple of very quick, quick thank yous. I'm sorry we're all doing it. Thank you so much to Jim for us being here. Thank you so much to Rukta for sponsoring the report. And thank you so much to Parthenon for doing all this great work with us um, pro bono. It's uh, fantastic. Um, just a few words from a, from a perspective of, of a, 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 I guess I am an impact investor. British Ventures is an impact investment fund. 
uh, management company. All the funds we raise had a dedicated social or environmental purpose, as well as achieving financial returns. And we have three types of funds under management at the moment, totaling 150 million pounds, which I think is about $250 million or somewhere around there moving every day as the pound disappears <laughs> through the floor. Um, so, uh, and we're very fortunate to be backed by private equity sector, so APAX partners, Gauti Hansen, and 3 i all involved in the fund manager. And we have 50 limited partners, over 50 limited partners. 50% of the money is institutional, and 50% of the money is endowments, private wealth individuals, families, etc. And it was this perspective from two, uh, from two points of view that came, that inspired us to work with Parthenon to write the report. So very briefly on those, the first was fundraising. So we, we, we raised that money um, in the context of, we started in 2002 and then uh, trying to tell people that you might want to combine social or environmental goals with your investment decision really was a bit of a, an unusual idea and a bit silly for a lot of people and we had to start from that base and there's been I think a really exciting change in the investment community. We've seen a great growth of interest across the investment community in this idea of investing for a deliberate social and environmental purpose and this idea that you might be combining those two uh, ideas when you make an investment decision, the financial return and the social and environmental impact. So there's been an enormous amount of growth and interest, but what we saw from our direct experience was there was still a lot of investors out there who might have done one impact investment. They might be very familiar with microfinance. They might have done environmental investment. They might have put some money in Bridges Ventures. Um, but from our experience of all those LPs, they didn't necessarily know the breadth of this impact investment sector. They didn't have it in a context and we wanted to put it in a context for them. Um, many reports that have been done around the impact investment sector were not directed at investors, and we wanted in this report to speak directly to investors and in their language, and thus we decided it's disappeared, but we decided to use the asset allocation table and to show the proliferation of different impact investments globally and also on the asset allocation table. And the other thing we heard a lot was, I'm, I'm really interested in this area, I'm an investor, I'm interested in this area, but I have two problems. One, I don't have a person on my staff who thinks about it. Who should be that person? And how should they start to think about it? We wanted this report to begin to address um, you know, if, if they had an individual that wanted to look into it, this would be a first place that they could look, along with other reports, to start to understand the sector. And the other thing they said a lot was it seems fuzzy. And I think it basically, I know it sits between philanthropy and investment, this space, but it just looks fuzzy to me. I think it probably means I don't make a good return. Is that right? And we wanted to show that, yes, there are, there's a part of the impact investment sector, as Tracy said, which is really about impact and for investors that are willing to take a higher risk or to get a lower return in order to achieve very difficult impacts or in order to build track record. But there's also emerging opportunities for investors who are bound by fiduciary responsibility or investors who need to get uh, attractive financial returns. And there's a whole financial first element of the market that is, that is developing. Um, and, and, and it's actually not the case that because you want to achieve a social and environmental purpose, you must take Low than market returns. We wanted to profile, so we have 15 case studies, there could have been so many more, 15 case studies across the different asset classes, across the world, and also across this divide between those that are in the impact first end of things and those that are financial first. As a practitioner, the last thing I'd say is that Bridges Ventures has ourselves experienced that. We manage funds which are venture funds that invest in regeneration areas and in sectors like healthcare, education, and the environment. And we hope and believe so far that we're making pretty attractive financial returns while also making and measuring social impact. And we would see those as clearly financial first funds. Uh, we've got 150 million pounds under management there so far, and we've had exits as high as 165% IRR, 22 times multiple. Pretty nice for, for anyone. Um, but we also found that social entrepreneurs who were coming to us and saying, my main purpose with my business is not to distribute profits, it's to make a social impact, but I need your risk capital. And they were coming to us all the time, and we found we couldn't, with our financial first money, invest in them. So we set up another case study that you'll see in the report, which is the Social Entrepreneurs Fund, which we actually started with philanthropic money, and we now excitingly have limited partners coming into that. But it's a single-digit financial return 
if we're lucky, and its focus is maximizing social impact through backing social entrepreneurs, many of whom don't, um, they may make profits, but they don't distribute profits. They are often non-profit making. So our, our direct experience as practitioners was that there is a need and an opportunity for us to innovate at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, financial first, i.e. markets type financial returns plus social impact, and then those harder to reach social impacts where you really need to raise money from strongly socially motivated investors who can go beyond, who are not bound by fiduciary responsibility and can go beyond um, and, 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 and reach more difficult areas by taking a higher risk or a lower return or a combination of those two. So we hope um, you have an opportunity to read the report. We can't go into the detail of all of the 15 case studies, um, but I, I hope that it leaves the reader with a sense that there is actually a bit more clarity in this impact investment space, that it can be communicated in the language of an investor, and that there is an increasing um, uh, burgeoning of opportunities to get involved in the space across asset classes and around the world as new funds come up, uh, such as Bridges Ventures and many of our peers around the world. So I'll stop there and look forward to questions. Thank you. Uh, we got up to a little bit of a late start, but we have some time for some questions from the audience. So um, I have many that I would like to ask, but I'll turn it over to you for now. Um, so would anyone like to ask the panel a question? Um, uh, as an individual investor, I um, have gotten a lot of benefit out of the vol recent volatility in markets because it has completely changed the conversation around alternative assets. And I, I put impact investing into kind of an alternative asset bucket in my mind. But I haven't seen the level of dislocation in impact investing uh, as there has been in sort of mainstream alternative investing. Uh, when, you know, do, do you think we'll ever see that level of dislocation? Why, why haven't we seen it yet? Why haven't we seen the markdowns and valuations in impact related private equity holdings? Other traditional private equity holdings, and will that day come? How will that conversation unfold? Well, sure. First of all, um, I would suggest, uh, and we articulate this heavily in the book, that thinking of impact investing as a separate or an alternative asset class is, is not an, is not a, uh, an appropriate approach. In that, as the Bridges piece points out, we also have a matrix in here is to recognize that again, impact investment is something that can be can be seen. I mean, a lot of talk right now is about using words like LP and GP, but let's not forget you can be doing impact investing in your cash. You can be doing impact investing in your fixed income portfolio. You can be doing impact investing in public equity, private equity, real estate, real assets. And so, I, I can't stress enough the importance of of, of understanding that. Uh, now to the point, to, to the question, uh, yes, markdowns are coming. Uh, you know, no industry, no investment strategy or thesis there is immune to uh, either cyclical, specific economic shocks, uh, a whole host of things. And so, for example, as much as I and many of us like to talk about microfinance and the success that, the, the success that microfinance has had, uh, in particular in light of this massive dislocation that, you know, Again, I go back to you have to go in and understand allocating to microfinance in this environment um, has you know had, has always had and has heightened risk, and so under and understanding that microfinance in a place like Latin America, particularly a place like Central America, where uh, there's a nuance, for example, where those are that, that, that those are those are economies that are dependent upon far more remittance from the United States, and those remittances aren't coming. There are other factors versus looking at microfinance in Asia in India versus looking at microfinance in Eastern Europe or some of these other markets. And so, again, I just go back to this, the, the importance of going through and understanding and evaluate and, and being able to understand that. And so what does that conversation look like? Well, if the work is done up front correctly between advisor and investor or by investor and their assessment and evaluation opportunities, they need to go into this, again, understanding what is what, 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 are, the, what are the risks associated with this. I would also argue, though, that uh, it's not uh, as we experienced with many of our client portfolios, even portfolios that were say flat or in line with the market on, on an aggregated basis, at least they still get to point to that impact. And so uh, I would suggest, in particular to the advisors in this room, is to recognize that 
you know, th th this is one thing that th this this is an area of investment that does offer you a, a distinct advantage in the sense that you can deliver equal returns from a financial perspective, and having that impact uh, it, it still gives you something positive to have in that conversation. And I actually wanted to just build on that question about the, the effect of the market volatility in the current economic climate. Um, and actually, Melissa, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how um, the current economic climate has influenced the demand you've seen from your clients for this type of activity. Yeah, it's, that's very interesting. I think our assumption was um, that as, um, as asset values began to plummet and as uh, uncertainty uh, plagued all investors and traditional financial institutions uh, vanished, lost their identities, et cetera, that uh, no one would have any appetite for anything out of the ordinary. Um, in fact, what happened was, in particular for philanthropists who were using the traditional U.S. foundation model for their, uh, for their, um, uh, as the basis for their efforts to make change happen, um, they began to realize, well, I have fewer grant dollars to give away. Uh, maybe I should pay attention to these people who are talking to me about being able to use the other 95% of what's sitting in this foundation. Um, and one, you know, in fact, um, one of our, um, one of the foundations that we work with, a gentleman who had, you know, gotten, I would say, faintly annoyed with his granddaughter in uh, 2000, in early 2008, about when she started talking about mission investing, uh, actually decided in, um, in 2009 that it might be a smart thing to try and, you know, put some money out to uh, help some of, some community-based uh, healthcare organizations. So people began to recognize um, that they had locked up a lot of their capacity to make change happen um, by refusing to think about impact investing or mission investing. Thank you. And how about other questions for the audience, or for the panel? Uh, Max? It's the, uh, one of the key words here, correlation. I wonder if uh, any research has been done in, uh, if, there is, if there is a lower correlation between several aspects. I'll actually, I don't know, Michelle or Roll, if you can take a look at the sure. correlation. Do you want to say something first? Um, well, I'm not a researcher. Okay. So well, I'll, 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 I'll add to, if you want to start, I'll add to. Sure. Uh, we reference actually in, in, in our piece, I don't know if they cut for five, <laughs> we, uh, for example, with regards to uh, microfinance and the work that folks like Joan Tran, who just walked in the room from IAMFI and, and some of the efforts. So, you, you know, there, 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 there's work there. It just came from an event uh, earlier this week on uh, real assets and you know number number of organizations that are looking at uh, sustainable timber uh, and farmland ranch land so you know nacreep so yes there are there are uh, numerous aspects but again as it relates to those those investments that we're referring to that fit within this financial first bucket uh, th those assessments and evaluations should be done again Predicated on the financial risk reward profile, it's, this is not. There's not. It's not about trading. A, 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 to, to date, there isn't a sustainable timber index versus a traditional timber index. Uh, and so, again, what I would encourage investors who are looking at least for sure in the financial first space, you need to assess and evaluate those correlations uh, relative to currently established benchmarks and, and standards. In the impact first, again, going back to I mentioned to you, for example, some of the early. Uh, some of the early microfinance investments that, that uh, were made on behalf of Cal Felicitas that were in, um, that were in uh, PRIs. So uh, clearly an impact first, but as I said, we didn't have a capital market assumption, so I just start from somewhere. And you know, that is part, that is part, that is the innovator's dilemma, part of the innovator's dilemma, you gotta start somewhere. So I, I took emerging market debt, discounted it by 500 basis points, worked in conjunction with our cap, my capital markets team to, to in effect create our own capital market assumptions so that we could plug it into the Monte Paglia simulation and say, okay, run our asset allocation, run test this, you know, stress test this portfolio, what's the outcome, what's the result? And again, now in retrospect, at least that, 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 that didn't work, but it, saw, it was a place, and now we have things like the symbiotics index, for example, and, and there are other things. So again, it's not, a, it's not a perfect science, but not being a perfect science is no reason or excuse not to do it. Just to add just a couple of things, uh, um, 
but let's be, I think it would be very unwise to suggest that this is a great way to make a completely uncorrelated investment and completely hedge yourself from economic downturns. Definitely not recommend that. There are some anecdotal stories which I've, uh, are, are of interest. I think sustainable um, forestry is one that actually did prove to be relatively uncorrelated in recent years. Um, but it, you know, it's not the whole of impact investment is uncorrelated, but there are different asset classes and living investments, some of which are less correlated. And just out of interest, our funds that invest in regeneration areas, and I know I was talking to Cohen Telsdor, who's here about some of the other funds um, in the US that invest in those areas, have found um, an element of our portfolio that's been very resilient because we're focusing on um, value for money type uh, propositions, and actually in the downturn, uh, we target them at uh, markets that were not able to pay and um, the whole, a whole middle class market came in um, who suddenly didn't want to pay a higher price for these sort of, for example, we have affordable gyms, um, we have um, flexible, affordable office space for small businesses, all done very stylishly and all in our inner city areas. And as the market has gone down, we've suddenly got this whole new market for those businesses, which is the more middle class customer who now no longer can or, or wants to afford to pay. So there's an interesting anecdotal slight uh, resilience in the portfolio because of our original social objective to invest in businesses that would thrive in, in poor areas. But across the board, I certainly wouldn't um, wouldn't want to make the claim here that this is the, the answer to the prayers in terms of hedging against a downturn. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I could just add some data. Uh, Michelle was looking at my, my handy little graph uh, a few hours ago. Um, I'm the president of the Community Development Venture Capital Alliance. It's a group of venture capital funds that make equity investments in businesses and low-income communities. And uh, we have a fund of funds that we invest in these funds. And we did a little anal analysis of the portfolios of all the funds in our portfolio and uh, the, the graph has, starting three years ago, at the beginning of 2007, um, normalized the S&P and the value of our portfolio at, at 100%. Um, they both dipped down to about 58% uh, of, of original value. So our funds were clearly marking down as, as uh, uh, the market was changing. They were marking their portfolio down. Uh, at this point, at the, the end of 2009, uh, the S&P is at 78% of its original value. Our funds portfolios, all, all across our funds, is at 114%. So I, 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 I can't explain, explain it fully, but the public markets, public companies, are now worth 78% of, of, of what they once were. Our small businesses and low-income communities are worth 114% of what they once were. Right, thanks for that perspective. Um, we have time for another question from the audience. I'm just curious. I looked looking over as you were speaking the, the, the um, uh, description. I just it's probably an overly simplistic question, but do the guidelines that are being discussed here fit the United Nations guidelines for sustainable investing, as are being promoted around the globe for pension funds? Should I have a, have a go? And, and, uh, British Ventures, as an independent investor, is also a signatory to the UNERI, okay. and um, many of the investors, the limited partners that would invest in our funds, uh, there would be a, a subsect a subsection of them that would be signatories to the UNERI. I think uh, the UNERI is much wider in terms of looking at the overall, if, to the extent that it applies to investment, it's looking at the whole of investment and, and trying to get all investors to be more socially responsible. Um, what we're trying to talk about in this room is is a slightly more a guerrilla action of, of proactively going out to achieve social or environmental goals rather than not doing harm and being responsible. So we are within the framework of the UNPRI, but I would suggest that we aim to go further than the framework of the UNPRI because we're talking here about funds that deliberately go out to achieve positive social purposes rather than funds that do investment with regard to reducing reducing harm, but definitely all part of the same overall movement. I don't know if anybody wants to add. I was just going to um, build on Michelle's point that um, having these guidelines is indicative of the larger ecosystem that is required to have this sector thrive. Um, you know, rating agencies, standard setting agencies, the right legal structure, the right government incentives, um, the you know, clearing houses in the middle, uh, intermediaries vis-a-vis -vis the 
form of a social investment bank. All of these things need to be in place, um, just like the UNPRI, to make this whole field flourish. I think many people often begin with a with the starting with a, I don't want to do any harm, uh, and then you can move into but now I'd like to actually do some good. So I think it is 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 part of a continuum. Ditto. <laughs> the ecosystem recognize that there are you know, UNPR is just one of many metrics and systems that are out there. And of course, since maybe he shouldn't plug himself, we can plug. I'll plug for the work that Jin is doing uh, with regards to addressing this because it is it is an important it is an important piece of the equation uh, is to identify what's appropriate because again UNPRI in the context of say sustainable timber, not what's there. It's you know there's FSC. There's again there, there are, there's different programs uh, that have to take these different factors. Yeah, it's absolutely critical, and I just I do want to mention that we one of our initiatives is the Impact Reporting and Investment Standards, or IRIS. And for those of you who are interested, please find Sarah or CJ for our IRIS team. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, we have time for just one more question. Um, would anyone like to, or do I get yeah, the privilege? Okay, what I will actually um, ask the panel station for a remark on is um, when you embarked on this project, um, and now thinking about where you what you think uh, what you learned through the process. Uh, what was the thing in the, uh, each of your reports that you found to be most surprising or something that you uncovered? And I'll open up to whoever wants to start. Uh, I'll start. I think the thing that we continue to find very surprising is um, the, um, the, the absence of, of any uh, evidence that uh, many quarters of the value of the statement that the truth will set you free. Um, we, we continue to find that there are people whose reaction to any conversation about different ways to think about investing, different ways to think about philanthropy, is to say, no, that's wrong, I can't do that, I won't do that, I shouldn't do that, it violates my fiduciary responsibility. We've had people say this as a knee-jerk response um, when the question of, of um, proxy voting is raised. No, I can't do that because it would violate my fiduciary responsibility to get a you know, market uh, rate of return. And we say, wait a minute, what, what does voting your proxies have to do with that? Um, and I, I just um, think we have not yet um, uh, crossed all the divides that we need to cross um, in this process and, and that you know, we have uh, our work cut out for us over the next few years. Um, this is not covered in the report, so it's more of a personal story. And um, to be on the other end of the spectrum, uh, to Melissa's comment, I'm going to be more of an optimist. So I tested this whole concept of impact investing uh, last summer when I was traveling home. And my hometown is Asia. My hometown is Hong Kong, where I grew up, and I also spent a fair amount of time in Singapore last summer, as Anthony knows. Um, and you know, Hong Kong and Singapore are probably two of the most capitalist societies in the world. You know, flat tax, income tax of 15% in uh, Singapore and 17% in Hong Kong. And if you think about the philanthropic um, developments in those two regions, uh, just to be focused, um, it's clearly leap years away from Europe, the UK, and the US. And when I start telling people about this type of investment and the idea that you can do two things at the same time, um, the leveraging effect and the recycling effect, the negative 100% model is completely uninspiring to them. Just giving away money, it's, it's kind of the often quoted um, story of you know giving people fish or teaching people how to fish. What these people say, and to borrow another analogy written you know, in another book, is that this has the potential to transform the fishing industry. This is a whole new way of thinking about doing good in the world. And maybe maybe these Asian investors or philanthropists don't have the legacy issues mm -hmm. of having set up these massive foundations with these uh, frameworks. Right. Um, they are very excited about the innovation and the leverage and the recycling um, implications of this particular personal story. Okay, so it sounds like the Chinese might be going to jump over and, <laughs> as in everything else, jump straight to Eleanor. Um, great. Um, I Not suppose, competitive. <laughs> um, 
I suppose, I suppose the nice thing, again, to be an optimist, the nice thing um, just for a practitioner that for the last uh, eight, nine years has been trying to go through this philosophical debate with every investor before I could even try to tell them how good Bridges Ventures is, this whole philosophical debate about is it okay to think about environmental or social concerns when you're making an investment. The nice surprise was just to find how many peers uh, we have around the world and how many very exciting and compelling and interesting um, investment vehicles there are around the world that we haven't been so clear about. And the other very nice thing was to have the gin, um, which as we came, as we started thinking about writing this report, someone very instantly from our advisory board said, you must use the gin. And the idea that someone else out there, sorry, the Global Impact Investment Network, I don't know if you're about to use the word gin. Um, the, uh, it, was, it, was, it was great to think that there was somebody else out there, especially with the backing of a name like Rockefeller, um, that would actually uh, try to help um, be another voice, a huge voice, telling investors that they could, it was allowed to think about those things at the same time as making investments. And my dream is that with these reports, with the backing of the Global Impact Investment Network in Rockefeller, one day I'll be able to walk into a named person within an investment um, organization <coughs> whose job is to look at this kind of investment. And my only job is going to be to show him how Bridges Ventures is the best and most compelling opportunity, not to have to start at the very, very beginning. So, um, for me, the, the, the big surprise was how many more there are out there. And I, I, I would just follow that, and I think, you know, in, in, in terms of, again, you know, over 10 years ago when we started looking at the stuff, you know, inter, uh, with Doug and I, I mean, I just, I think one of the, the simplest things in the book, page 35 and 36, you know, 10 years ago, there was maybe four or five websites, three or four resources that we could turn to uh, as we were looking to tackle the subject, and here we almost ran out of room, a page and a half of just websites with quality information regarding the space. Uh, I think that, that, that is a very pleasant surprise. I think the other thing that's a very pleasant surprise, uh, speaking anecdotally from uh, similar experiences, again, most recently, uh, several weeks ago, uh, attending a conference.